Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's great to see a full room. Uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Lopez with us today. As you know, the Francis McClellan Institute is a research institute dedicated to supporting research that helps improve the lives of children, youth, and families. We do this through our research initiatives that bring faculty and students together across campus and across universities to work on pressing issues of early childhood, adolescence, Latino families, and mechanisms of social and health relationships. As you know, Frances McClellan was an incredible advocate for women, people with disabilities, and children. She also was very proud of her immigrant family background, and we carry her legacy forward with our, in, with our work in the Institute today. We're very grateful to Pamela Turbeville for sponsoring this speaker series on family and consumer sciences. Pamela is a U of A alumni and won the Cal's Alumni Achievement Award in 2000. Today, we're very lucky to have Dr. Lopez join us to talk about her work on asset pedagogies. She's an associate professor in the Department of Education of Higher Ed? No, Educational Edu Policy. Educational Policies and Practice, sorry. Okay. Um, her background is a PhD in Educational Psychology. Prior coming to the U of A, she was a faculty member at Marquette University for six years. Her research examines how educational settings promote achievement for Latino students. She has been funded by the American Educational Research Association Grants Program. She received the American Psychological Association Early Career Award, and she held a postdoctoral fellowship from the National Academy of Education, the Spencer Foundation. She is a National Education Policy Center Fellow, and she has served as a visiting fellow for the Transborder Communities at Arizona State University. She's on the editorial boards for several journals in psychology and education and is currently the Senior Associate Editor for the American Journal of Education and co-editor for the American Educational Research Journal. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, do I get it? Oh, my God. Everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that I did that I, I, I talk about it in terms of nurturing confianza. Um, so I wanted to kind of define, oh, it's not moving. Sorry, y'all. There we go. Sorry. Okay. So I wanted to define what confianza is. So it's a word in Spanish, um, and I took a little bit of liberty with the last one. but. It encapsulates the study that I'm sharing with you today because confianza can mean many, many things, right? So one of them is confidence. So, si yo tengo confianza, if I have faith in myself, if I have confidence in myself, I, I know I can do something. And we know through research that that's one of the strongest predictors of student achievement, right? It's the self-competence that students have. Um, confianza also means trust. Si me tienen confianza, if you trust me, right, then we have that bond. And the study that I'm sharing with you really looks at the trust that can be built between teachers and students with asset-based pedagogies. And the last one is hope. Um, it's not a literal translation, but it's really the hope that these practices can address the achievement disparities that we continue to see right, between marginalized groups and those that have more privileges in society. So I have this image to kind of demonstrate that a lot of researchers see schools as a function of replication, right? That rather than being a, a mobility factor, schools just replicate the things that we see in society. So I kind of wanted to walk through some of what we know and why we tend to see the same things in schools that we do in society. But before I do that, I, I was trained as an educational psychologist, and I think everybody, even if you're not a traditional K-12 educator, has heard of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? So what teachers believe right, plays out in how they behave in the class, and students infer those things and meet those expectations. Right? So this work on expectations has a very long history, and 
although it seems common sense, right, that teachers with high expectations would do certain things, um, it doesn't necessarily give us what we need to address achievement disparities. But the research has given us some things. So one of them is we know a lot about what teachers believe and how they communicate these things in the classroom. So an example would be wait time. If I call on a student and I then skip and don't want to wait for that student to answer and call on someone else, I've sent the message to the class. I didn't think that person could answer the question and now everybody is aware that the teacher didn't believe it and so this starts to build in the student. So we know a lot about teacher behaviors in terms of what they should be doing. But as I mentioned, we also know from this research that students infer this. They know how their peers feel about them, they know how their teachers feel about them, and critically, how they perceive this affects what they believe about themselves. So this is how the self-fulfilling prophecy works. If the teacher has doubts, students will end up doubting themselves, and then we see these achievement problems, right? These achievement disparities. So the model that we tend to see in teacher expectation work that has this long history tends to look like this. We look at teacher beliefs, what they do in terms of their behaviors, how it affects students' achievement identity, and maybe perhaps their student belonging. Do I belong in, in this school? And all of these things then help us understand achievement. And we've had this research for decades. And just by pulling up National Assessment of Educational Progress data, that's been around since 1969, it gives us a snapshot of how students perform in reading, math, writing, and a bunch of other things in fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade. So this is fourth grade reading NAEP, and I know the font is tiny, but the point is, I don't think you need to see the font to be able to read who we have at the bottom and who we have at the top. And if you look, the lines are pretty flat, right? It's, we don't really see a lot of changes in reading, and those disparities are there over many, many years. The same is true in math. So what you'll notice is there's a slight increase, but those disparities do not shrink. Same is true for eighth grade, right? Kind of a flat line. And it's also true for, for math in eighth grade. So we see these disparities. And there's research I wanted to share with you. This was not my own, but it helps explain why these achievement disparities can be so stubborn. And so I'm just going to walk through a very short part of Jeannie Oak's study, um, chapter four in her book, Keeping Track. And in this book, she looked at tracking, at stratification, at what we see in schools. And she said, I'm not setting out to really look at what happens to our black students, to our Latino students. But sure enough, when I looked at schools with tracking that didn't have gifted and talented, they tended to be students of color, right? She said, that wasn't what I set out to do, but I already saw these differences in the types of schools. So she asked teachers and students questions to kind of try to uncover what happened to students in high tracks, what she calls high tracks, and low tracks. So she asked teachers, what are the five most critical things that you want your students in your cl class to learn this year? So if you were a success as a teacher, what would you have done? What would your students have learned? And in the high track, I'm not going to read each of the sentences to you, but I've got some key phrases underlined. So listen to the words. This is high track. Interpreting, identifying, thinking activities, reasoning logically, the art of research, how to test and prove ideas, scientific reasoning and logic, investigating, thinking critically, interpretation, logical thought processes, and analysis, love and respect for math, right? So all of these things are what we call high-level thinking skills, and this was in the high track. So now we have the answer she got from teachers in the low track. What did you want your students to learn? Independence, responsibility for working with people, understanding basic words, to be able to work with other students, to be able to follow directions, respecting my position, responsibility, <coughs> right? So just by looking at the teacher answers, and if you think of that little image I showed you at the very beginning, when we think of shrinking those achievement disparities, there's no way the students in the low tracks would ever do that because they were not being challenged to be able to be prepared for that higher level, right? And so she also asked the students so she could get the student voice in terms of the high and low track. So the high track, right? The question is, what is the most important thing you've learned in school this year? And it was things like how to do research in a college library. Analyze famous writings. Um, do experiments, the basis of our economic system, the economy, and business, right? And then we go to the low track. Getting a job, getting a job, preparing for the above, 
or nothing, right? And this class is a big waste of time. English is boring. And then the very last one, I think, encapsulates why this is such an issue. I've learned just a small amount in this class. I feel that if I was in another class, that I would have a challenge to look forward to each and every time I entered the class. I feel that if I had another teacher, I would work better, right? So this is the essence of expectations and of high and low tracks and the idea that if we really want to close these achievement disparities, we need to do more than pay lip service, right, to, to expectations. Um, and we've had this research for a very long time. And I think it's very important to realize that there isn't a single teacher preparation program that doesn't talk about expectations. It's part of licensure st standards. If I walk into a K-12 setting, I can ask teachers about this, and they know about this. They know about expectations. But even though they know this, we know historically marginalized students are under underrepresented in any metric we want to use. If it's achievement test scores, if it's high school completion, college matriculation, we still see those disparities. So something's missing, right? Teacher expectations has not given us what we need to be able to answer these things. But even within educational psychology, there's an, like a debate. And a couple of educational psychologists said, you know, in our research, this condemnation for teachers having low expectations is not what we see in the data. Because when we look at students' prior achievement and what teachers believe, they match, right? So it's this ahistorical view, right, without considering that maybe teachers are looking at face value what students are coming in with and not considering the trajectory of schooling that they've had that then gives them the student that they have in front of them, right? This history of what Angela Valenzuela calls schooling, how they don't belong because they don't see themselves in the curriculum. So one of the issues is that if we look away from educational psychology, and even in, in some strands of ed educational psychology, we know that teachers' expectations are biased against students of color. I mean, we have a lot of evidence of this. And our own Luis Moll did some of this work examining how for Latino students, for example, the expectations was low. And how was he able to see this? A watered down curriculum. This idea of what we call pobrecitos, that we can't challenge them with a more rigorous curriculum because they might not be capable, right? And therein lies that bias, that they can't do this. So they wouldn't get the demanding tasks that they need to look like those high track classrooms. So there's a theory that I wanna share with you all. I did not create it, it's Clark McCone who created this theory, set theory. And he says there's a reason in, th that operates um, in society, <laughs> this, this theory that operates in society that helps us understand why we see disparities. And so there are two main forces that comprise this. So it's direct influences and signal influences. So the first one, direct influences are things that he argues, they affect everybody. It doesn't matter what your background is, they're going to affect you if they vary in terms of, of the rigor. So it's things like parenting practices, neighborhood influences, and quality of instruction. And we know a lot about direct influences. So what we tend to see, and I'm sure, what I'm sure, I know you can't read it, but I'll read some of it with you. Teachers are evaluated for their direct influence practices. This is how much the research has informed the kind of classroom observations that if we were to walk over to TUSD, they have one of these instruments. And they look at things like many of the other measures, right? Like positive climate, which in one measure might be called um, creating an environment of rapport. So you want to see that it's a place of respect and there's a positive climate and everybody's kind of happy and that's what we want to see and that's a direct influence that's going to affect everybody. It's also quality of feedback, right? Am I asking questions, am I probing, am I asking those higher level skills? That will affect everybody. It's also things like analysis and problem solving, those higher level thinking skills. So these socially transmitted messages and they're all socially transmitted, right? They affect all children and if we had statistical control for them, they would eliminate all achievement disparities in the data, but this is the critical piece, until children turn eight. That's about third grade. So a visual description of this would look like this. So I have my pre-K to second grade, right, data, and I see achievement disparities, so I plug in parenting practices, I plug in neighborhood influences, and quality of instruction. I've eliminated all the variance, right, in terms of that, that achievement disparity. But then I go to grade three and it starts to grow even when I'm holding those things in the model. And it continues to increase as students get older. So it is not explaining everything, right, in terms of the achievement disparities. And so that's when we get 
to signal influences. So signal influences are social events that signal to members of negatively stereotyped groups that they are devalued because of their group membership. And the critical piece of set theory is that I mentioned by age eight we start to see these disparities. We also have evidence that that's around the age when, stu when children from marginalized communities are aware of stereotypes. And they are actually aware of them often as early as age five. So by kindergarten, they know the stereotype. It might be girls in math, right? Or race-based or ethnicity-based. So we, we start to think of signal influences as these messages that students receive that are deficit-based, right? So deficit beliefs, which is the opposite of asset-based. So just to give you an example of deficit beliefs, when I've interviewed some teachers, not all of them, right? But I've asked them the question, um, what do you believe would increase the achievement of your Latino students? I would get answers like, if we educated parents, right, to help increase achievement. Because if parents value education and make it a priority, so do the children. And that parents really need to understand the importance of school. I've never interviewed a parent, right, who thought school wasn't important. But there's this entrenched belief. And if we ask ourselves, well, where do these beliefs come from? Is it the community? In part, right? In part, it's society. Every movie, every book, every image we see, that we see how marginalized communities are portrayed gets to the back of our mind, and that's how we make decisions. But the academy, right, is also partly to blame because it ends up disseminating information like this. So this image was on NPR's website after a study that was published in the Hispanic Journal of Behavioral Sciences came out. And they had the transcript of the study. And so what do we see, right? That there's this gap with toddlers, Mexican-American toddlers. And the assumption is that Latina mothers don't talk to their children. And that's where the gap lies, right? Never mind that they weren't assessing Spanish language. It was all in English. But this is what the public would see, right? This is what they would hear, further entrenching this belief that Latino parents are just not doing the things, right? to help their children succeed. So these biases come from many, many places, right? And what's really interesting, to me it was very interesting, is when I looked up the original person who coined the term self-fulfilling prophecy, it was Robert Merton in 1948. He was a sociologist and he wrote an article. And in the article, it was not even about education. It was about racial issues in the United States. And embedded in there, after he talked about the self-fulfilling prophecy, he said, you know, we want to fix everything with education. The appeal, right, is just part of our fabric in, in America. But he says it's an illusion to think that we're going to fix everything with education. Because how are we going to fix racial education, right, if we don't have the teachers? Who's going to do the educating? Because the teachers in the communities share the very prejudices that we're urging them to combat. So how do you take people with biases and tell them, OK, fix the biases that we have, right? This was somehow buried. It never made its way in a lot of the early work in educational psychology. But it's critical because study after study after study that we're seeing is that these biases are real and they have long-lasting effects. So here's one that's relatively recent, the preschool study that I think a lot of you have probably heard of, where they took 135 teachers at this conference, preschool teachers, and they told them to participate in this study. They wanted them to look at this video and they had to try to guess and see where the challenging behavior was going to happen, right? Preschool. But the catch was they were hooked up to eye monitors, right? To see where their eye gaze was looking. Where do you think that they were looking, right? It was the students of color and in particular, the boy. And so with this tracking, they were already waiting for it. And the kicker was there was no challenging behavior. But automatically, they were already waiting for it to happen. And we have evidence of this, right? So we can't really deny it. And early when I was getting ready to talk to superintendents, it was back uh, last October, this was in my mailbox as a member of the American Psychological Association, right? I get the monitor on psychology and the cover, right? This boy would be three times more likely to be placed in a gifted education program if he had a black rather than a white teacher. What is behind, right? This racial disparity in our education system. So it's a pervasive issue. If we were to pull schools um, data to look at retention, at um, expulsion, we still see those racial disparities. Who makes it to AP classes? Who makes it to gifted and talented? We still see those racial disparities. So to deny that there are biases playing a huge role in this, we're ignoring the facts that have been with us for quite some time, right? 
So we know that children, right, who belong to these stigmatized groups for various reasons, <coughs> become aware of these stereotypes earlier than other children. And because they're aware of it, they're more susceptible to their effects. So this isn't an issue of we need to address it in high school, we need to address it in middle school. Every single teacher needs to have the knowledge, right, to address the biases, because we all have them. It's not just white teachers which make up the majority of our teaching force. Every single one of us, because we live in a society that bombards us with images, that positions marginalized communities in a certain way, have these biases, right? So it's work for all of us to engage in. So the problem here, right, is this is the model that has been used in trying to look at why there's achievement disparities and what, what do we do to change teachers' beliefs and their behaviors. And if we look away from that work, we have a lot of research that already tells us what we should be seeing in classrooms. I'm calling it asset-based pedagogy because it has tons of different names and I'll share those with you in a moment. But what they all share is that teachers have these unique competencies that are essential right, to teaching historically marginalized students. And the key thread that unites all these different theories is that it views students' culture as a strength, not a deficit. So if, just a generic example, if a student speaks Spanish, they can be bilingual versus they need to learn English, right? So that huge difference in viewing, they already come with something. Let's build on that and amplify what they already come with. So I did do the research, right? It's not cut and dry because there were some issues in the asset-based pedagogy research, right? One of them is that in a lot of the research, it becomes this issue of cultural celebration or trivialization or essentializing culture, right? where we see teachers approaching this by substituting, infusing culture for political analysis. The, the idea that we have stratification and that needs to be addressed, right? And another issue is that of the literature that does capture it without essentializing it, very little of it actually documents that it improves learning. And this is critical if we're going to inform policy, right? We need to make that link explicit. So instead what we have is they stop short because they look at student engagement and find, all right, students are more engaged. That means they're going to do better. That's not enough, right? We can't just assume that because we see students engaged that learning is actually taking place, right? So what I set out to do, a lot of scholars were, were making this call, we need to explicitly link right, these asset-based practices with student achievement to actually move the needle in terms of the practices that are, that are done. And I have this disclaimer, and the reason I have this disclaimer is everybody in here that has tried to publish, and those of you who will try to publish, you will have reviewer two, right, who always pushes back, and any time I've used achievement scores, I go, why are you using the very things that are used to stratify students, right? And James Gould wrote The Mismeasure of Man, and I agree with James Gould where he argues it's the use of the assessment, right? It's not necessarily that this assessment exists. So, there are problems with the way we see test scores being used because they doom students instead of help them. But I continue to use them for two key reasons. One of them I've shared with you, right, is to address this need, to show evidence. And I went through this phase in my trajectory, um, my, I'm still kind of early career, but in my trajectory so far, where I was at first very naive, I'm gonna change the world with this evidence, and then landed in Arizona. It's like, well, okay, evidence doesn't always work. Um, but, but we do have the recent case, evidence works, right? So the MAS was deemed, the banning of MAS was deemed unconstitutional in part with a testimony, right, that showed students did better. So I'm somewhat of a believer, but somewhat of a cynic, so somewhere in the middle. Um, but I've seen this work be able to inform what's going on in the desegregation case in, in Tucson Unified. So it has practical implications. So this work, I think the work that we do to demonstrate that these things are needed by students is, is critical. The other reason I use achievement is because of Lisa Delpit's argument that it is also about giving marginalized students access to power. And power means being able to get those test scores, learning what we need in school and what is validated in school. It just means you don't have to abandon your cultural background to get it. But if we want them to be able to access right this higher level, they need to be given this access to power. But I also look at other things, right? It's not just achievement. I look at perceptions of discrimination. And by perceptions, I don't mean um, make believe that they're not real. I mean how we infer things is more powerful 
than the reality. It's the reality for us. So how people perceive their environment and their perceptions of discrimination, which we know has negative impacts on achievement. I also look at self-competence. It's one of those robust predictors of student achievement. If I believe I'm capable, I'm going to put forth the effort to keep on learning and challenging myself. And ethnic identity, right? Even among younger students. So my study looked at grades three through five, so later elementary school. And it didn't include exploration, but it did include, are you proud of your background? Are you proud of, of learning about your heritage? So, bless you. So with this framework and including this other literature, I redid the whole framework to be able to do the study. And so it included not just teacher beliefs, right, in terms of expectations, but what I'm calling critical awareness. Several people call it critical awareness. So a special and unique kind of belief that teachers and knowledge that teachers have to have, and I'll explain all of these terms shortly. And instead of just behaviors like wait time, challenging, right, asset-based behaviors that really reflect students' background and culture, perceived discrimination, ethnic identity as part of the whole person that we have in, in our classrooms, right? And then ethnic, uh, academic identity and achievement to answer these three questions that I'm going to review for you, right, for, for the study. So. Before I jump into the actual study, I wanted to give a context. We're all here in Arizona, and I think it's very critical to just lay the groundwork about what it meant for the people that I recruited and what it means to have the people participate in the study. And so Arizona, in the Nash Network for Public Education State Report Card, they, I was part of it, right? I looked at the data. But they looked at all the states and different practices that they had in place and graded them from an A to an F. Are they doing things that are research-based to help students? And Arizona earned an F, and I don't think any of us in this room are surprised, right? Because they didn't use, we don't use research-based strategies in the state to improve education um, for equal opportunity. Um, we also have a state that does not pay their teachers a living wage right, in terms of salaries. Second lowest after controlling for cost of living in all of the United States. And I know that if you're reading the news, we have a severe teacher shortage, right? Because not only is it deprofessionalized and you are insulted, it does not pay, right? So we also lead the nation in terms of the reduction of funding, not only in K-12, but also in higher education. So we have, as I mentioned, this extreme teacher shortage, which our governor, instead of addressing the issue of teacher pay, says, let's just make it so teachers don't need to have this certification, right? So more of this deprofessionalization of teaching that we have in the context. In the school district where I did the work, right, teachers are evaluated using value-added models. And so this can mean different things depending on the school district, but in this particular district, it includes their grade on how effective they are as teachers, includes other teacher scores. So think of yourself being evaluated by somebody else's performance, right? Their prior scores, if you've ever taught, are classrooms always the same? And the answer is no, they can vary quite substantially, right? The school's overall performance, and just to contextualize this, I had a student who wanted to go teach at a school that was rated a D. And she told me, I know that by going to this school, automatically my evaluation is going to be docked one whole level because it is a D school, right? So not really trying to recruit effective teachers either. Um, and other factors that are completely out of their control. So these are the teachers that I went to begging, please will you participate in this study, right? So it shouldn't be any surprise. The teachers that said yes, it was about 568, um, they had, where's the average year of teaching? They were, they were experienced teachers. These were not novice teachers. They had been in the classroom. Most of them were part of the community. Most of them were Latinas. Um, they were invested in the work. So yes, there's a selection threat, right? When you're asking for volunteers, but this is the context of the work where I was recruiting teachers. Um, to be able to participate in the study. And so what you'll see is there were six schools, and some of them were magnet, magnet bilingual, and some of them were not, some of them weren't a magnet at all. And the reason I did this, it was purposeful, to be able to get along a continuum with talking to district personnel, I need to be able to get schools that have these high levels of asset-based practices all the way down on the continuum. So I was able to get a quite, quite a bit of variability in terms of the schools. And I think you're all very much aware of the demographics of this district, right, Tucson Unified, where in the mid-90s, this is also part of the important context, in the mid-90s where we had open enrollment, choice, and charter schools kind of explode in Arizona, where parents started to opt to get out, we saw a white flight in the district. 
So originally when the desegregation order was um, passed in 78, it was 65% white, and it is currently about 65% Latino. So there's been this complete flipping, right? It's, it's a browning district, as, as they would call it. So the very first question, now that I gave you the background, is how do teachers' expectations and critical awareness predict student achievement? So this, these two kinds of knowledge that teachers have. So what is this critical awareness that I've been talking about? Um, a lot of different scholars talk about it in different ways. But it is this essential understanding that helps reduce biases, right, with knowledge, because there's an understanding that there's a historical context for students, that we just don't have them here and that they just need to try really hard, right, and that'll eliminate all disparities, that there's a history that plays a role in what we see in our classrooms. It's also knowledge about the discrepancy of what we tend to see in classrooms being validated as knowledge. Um, I had a student once explain, in terms of asset-based pedagogy, asset-based pedagogies, does it work? Yes, because our curricula tends to favor white students, and they tend to do quite well. So we have evidence that it works, right? So it's this understanding that all our students are not validated in the curriculum that we have in schools. And it's also an understanding that this curriculum just serves to replicate the same things we see in schools into society, right? And this is an important point, um, because if we understand how these past injustices have contributed, and we hear a lot about achievement gaps, Gloria Latson Billings argues, you know, they're not achievement gaps, they're opportunity gaps. It's not the student's fault, right? It's the structure in society that has contributed to these disparities that we continue to see. So what did I find? Um, what you see here on the left, right, are in standard deviation units. And I s had student data from the very beginning of the school year and then assessed them again at the end. So I controlled for the beginning. I wanted to see what effect the teacher had removing, right, that earlier achievement because we know it's so highly correlated with later achievement. And so I found that teachers that had low expectations and high expectations, the moment I included prior achievement did not predict later achievement. And this makes perfect sense because their beliefs, their expectations were highly correlated with students' prior achievement. So they didn't add anything. They saw how students performed, their expectations met it, right? So they didn't behave in a different way that would add to achievement in, in the classrooms. So in terms of critical awareness, if they had low expectations and low critical awareness, it's self-fulfilling prophecies. If I don't have the knowledge that can mitigate the biases I have, my expectations are going to be low, right? But I can say things that reflect I might have high expectations. But if I lack critical awareness, those biases are going to inform my practice more than me going in there and saying, I believe all students can achieve, right? Because the moment I start to see things actually happening in the classroom, I'm going to alter my behavior given what I see if I don't have this knowledge, right, to kind of counter these biases. So we're susceptible to biases without this knowledge. So what does that look like, right? What, what did teachers say who had low critical awareness but high expectations? And when I interviewed them, they would say things like, the difficulties I notice are universal. They just lack persistence, the students do. If they just had the persistence, I know they could achieve because I believe that they can achieve, right? But they also need a strong family environment. If they just had that strong family environment, they would really be able to achieve. Or if parents were more involved, that would change everything for the student. Or the student is just not interested in education. If they were just interested, right, then we would see achievement. So there's this, and if you notice, these answers that look like many of the others, it's blaming, right, parents or students, which is very different from what I'm about to show you with high critical awareness. So when teachers had high critical awareness and high expectations, that's when we saw the student's achievement increase by about half a standard deviation over the year. That's huge. It, it's a medium effect if we just look strictly at effect sizes, but in terms of what we see in achievement disparities, that almost eliminates half of the so-called gaps that we see up to fourth grade. So just with one teacher that believes or has this knowledge, we already see the elimination of quite a sizable amount of these achievement disparities. So their, in their interviews, they would say things like, I believe culture is very important. I make sure to integrate it, integrate it into social studies because they need to see themselves in the curriculum. Or 
we need a curriculum that understands our students' culture. They're often not stimulated in school because teachers may not know students' background interests and fail to incorporate into the lessons. So the huge difference here, right, it's not blaming the parents and the students. It's saying it's the curriculum, it's me. I need to be sure that the student is engaged because of what I'm doing, not that they're just not motivated, right? So huge difference in terms of these two beliefs. So the next question I looked at, now that I saw that this critical awareness helped um, address disparities, how are critical awareness and teacher expectations related to behaviors? Because this was about knowledge. But what do teachers do, right, when they have this knowledge? And this is where we get to asset-based pedagogies. So I mentioned, I'm calling it this generic term, because we have all of these plus many, many more, right? And in our particular context here, a lot of the teachers I interviewed would say funds of knowledge because we had that going on at the, right, with Lismol and Norma Gonzalez and so on. So a lot of the teachers are very aware, in fact, a few of the principals who participated in my study had been funds of knowledge teachers. So they were very much aware. But these, all these different things, even though they're called different things, share what I found to be three main components. So they're all a little bit nuanced and, and unique but they share three key things that I'm going to share with you. The first one is language, right? So asset-based pedagogy honors language. And when we say language, I'm not just talking Spanish. I'm talking about students' vernacular, right? The, the way students speak, which helps them to code switch, not just from Spanish to English, right? But the student vernacular that they are engaged in, and then standard English, right? So according to Teresa Perry and Lisa Delpit, this quote comes from um, their book that was during the Ebonics debate in, in Oakland schools. And they said, language prejudice remains a legitimate, right, so-called prejudice. That is, one can generally say the most appalling things about people's speech without fear of correction or contradiction. And you can sit in a classroom and see this and how students are corrected, right, not valued at all. So it isn't just about Spanish, but given that we are in the Southwest and we have a large Latino population, right? I also have this quote by our own Norma Gonzalez from her book, I Am My Language, and I love this book. I encourage you to read it if you haven't. And she talks about language in terms of to speak, to, to speak of language is to speak of ourselves. Language is at the heart, literally and metaphorically, of who we are, how we present ourselves, and how others see us. The ineffable link of language to emotion to the very core of our being is one of the ties that binds children to a sense of heritage. It's that connection of being able to speak to maybe their grandparents, right? And there was this beautiful interview, he's a third grader, at one of the schools that participated in the study, um, where he's asked, and it's a dual language school, bilingual school, and he's asked about speaking Spanish. And his answer was, well, basically, I'm a Mexican, and I don't care what they say about my culture, I just like speaking in Spanish. So even at age eight, he was very much aware that where we are, there's a context, right, that is very anti-Spanish for certain groups. It depends where you live and what your background is. Because for some, it's absolutely fine to be in a Spanish immersion class, right? But if students come in with a language, that needs to be remedied, right? So this just really captured, I thought, the, the intermingling between um, culture and language. The other thread that cuts across all of these is cultural knowledge. And teachers are often trained, um, very often trained, to access students' prior knowledge. That's how we build knowledge, right? We build on what we already know. But for our marginalized students, it's honoring their, their knowledge in ways that schools don't tend to honor knowledge, right? So it's constructivism, and it's phrased in a lot of different ways, pulling knowledge out, um, what Chris Gutierrez calls repertoires of practice, right? Funds of knowledge, what do they do in the home and how do we build that into the school? And practices in which youth directly engage out of school. So cultural knowledge is honoring what students come with, but how do you know what they know unless you get to know your students, right? So instead of teachers just assuming and giving a quick test, right, it's really getting to know the families and the students and then incorporating that into their curriculum which brings me to that last component, right? It's cultural content integration. So cultural content integration is about incorporating students' culture into the curriculum because of the belief that it affirms the legitimacy of the cultural heritage of different ethnic groups as worthy content to be taught in schools, not relegated to a month or the back of the chapter, but infused throughout the curriculum honoring students' backgrounds, right? 
And for teachers, because our curricula do not tend to reflect students' lives, it means they need to know what they need to incorporate by knowing what their students' backgrounds are, right? So decisions about what information should be included, how to integrate it, and where to integrate it. So rather than have just a person with n no certification, right, you can see it requires a lot of knowledge and professionalism to be able to do these high leverage practices. Um, and in terms of the curriculum, I thought this was very, very important because we always hear that to get kids ready for school, right, we should be reading to them. But even if we take our young children to the library and have them check out picture books, they're not seeing themselves in the books, right? So there's this huge divide. About 61% of the US population is white, but they make up close to 90% of picture books. And if we look at other students, American Indians, 1% of the population, 0.3% of books. Um, for African Americans, 13% of the population, around 3% of books. And for our Latino population, about 20% of the population, 65% in this district, less than 2% of books. Students are not seeing themselves even before they enter school into these things that are validated in school settings. So it's not something that we need just at the high school level. It's something students should be seeing from the moment they walk into schools. So what I saw in my research, right, was when teachers had critical awareness, they maintained high expectations but they also engaged in practices that honored language, that honored cultural knowledge, and they incorporated material into the curriculum that reflected students' lives. So there was this connection between what they believed and what they actually did in classrooms. So how is that linked to student identity, right? If teachers believe these things and are doing these things in their classroom, how do we see that inform what students believe about themselves? And so <clears throat> what I found was teachers who did this at the highest levels. Students perceived discrimination was about a quarter of a standard deviation lower by the end of the year. So they went into the classroom with a particular level and just experiencing that classroom, their feelings of discrimination, right, went down by a quarter of a standard deviation. While their ethnic affirmation went up by a quarter of a standard deviation. And this is key in the state of Arizona, right? So part of the premise um, against the Mexican-American studies classes was they said that it would promote hatred. And what I found in my study, even though they were younger children, is that when they were given this background or their culture in their classroom, they had higher levels of others' ethnic affirmation. They wanted to learn more about other cultures. They were more open to learning about other cultures. So rather than hate, right, they wanted to learn more because they felt proud of their background and wanted to learn more about others. And almost by two-thirds raised academic identity. So these are students who felt even more competent, uh, right, about their reading and math. And this was both in reading and mathematics that I, that I found these effects. And so all of these things together, right, helped explain about close to half a standard deviation, higher achievement when teachers did these things. And so I'm going to end um, to open it up with, you know, questions, but this quote that I absolutely love um, by Patricia Gandara, and there's a little bit of sarcasm in this, but she says, by casting Latino students as bearers of valuable assets, language and cultural knowledge, we may find, right, that they have as much or more to offer as students who have traditionally garnered success in US schools. Perhaps we could even relabel our Latino students in a way that also allows them to believe in their own potential, right? So with that, I'd like to open up the questions. None, okay. <laughs> That's right, me time. Yeah. How would you think that Confianza extends um, past elementary and middle school and high school and then thinking about it in higher ed? Is it oh, that, yeah. you know, thinking you have all the acid based pedagogy and this, this nurture of Confianza that, yeah. that holds you over while you pursue your higher education? Think of that way? I would say yes, but I mean, this, I, I don't believe that this, the work that I did should end in the K-12 arena, right? Because I, I think that if we're truly interested in making sure that our marginalized populations make it to college, stay in college, then the institution has to change, right? Rather than, it's the same argu argument of we have to make sure our students are resilient. They're resilient, right? 
What has to change is the setting where we want them to be successful. Um, and if we look at the teaching profession as a whole, it's about 90% white women, right, who enter the profession. So we see very few men, for, for example, so I'm gonna pick on, on gender here. Very few men at the elementary level. And we see, I think, like 90% of the Ds and Fs go to boys at the elementary school. So whenever you have, I think, well-meaning individuals who don't understand, right, these different intersectionalities of gender, race, ethnicity, um, SES, all these things, I, I think that it perpetuates this deficiency view, and we just have to look at those metrics to see it's not working. So when we look at college completion, we still have ways to go, right? So I, I think it can completely extend. And I know Cecilia Rios Aguilar does work on like funds of knowledge at the college level, and it's critical, right? But how do you get that in like the weeding out courses, like the sciences that are really designed to weed out students and are not that interested in making sure that the curriculum aligns. So, yeah, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Yeah. So you classified your schools as like you had like the three bars of the school. Can you talk about the interaction between how the school was classified and yeah. then the teachers? Oh, that? that's a great question. So it, it's very interesting because so in the I had two schools that were very very what I'd call like culturally responsive. And in both of those schools, one of the principals had been a funds of knowledge teacher, but in another school, and I know this is going to out the school for many of you, um, it was, it's very committed to social justice. It is in its mission. Many of the, teacher, the teachers all share this. And it's very explicit even with the students. So I wouldn't say that all the teachers in these schools, not all of them, had these, but there was this general consensus that if I am a teacher at this school, this is the expectation. And they were all good with that. And many of them had been there for years, right? And as you go along the continuum, the, the schools who were at the bottom didn't see, you know, culture was not part of their mission. They were just a regular school. Teachers didn't have this background. And to be fair, um, teachers generally do not get this training. And in my study, the teachers who had the critical awareness had been bilingually certified. So the reason they had the knowledge, so there's the self-selection first into bilingual, right, certification. They shared the language. They couldn't really use it except in the dual language schools. But they had to take courses that many other teachers don't on language and power, on stratification, on civil rights. So they, because of their certification, had gained this knowledge, but they self-selected into this particular certification. So that was more found in the bilingual schools than the others, for sure. Is, did that answer your question? Yeah, I was just wondering too, of like, you know, for the a teacher who may have high expectations and a high critical awareness, but in that low school versus maybe a teacher who didn't look so great, but was in a, a culture where the kid was otherwise surrounded by folks with those expectations. Yeah, um, so in the, in the highest level school, there was a teacher and you could see it that she didn't have the critical awareness. I mean, so that aided, you know, in the variability. Um, but she left the school, like, soon after. So they create a culture, right, where you either feel like you belong or you're going to look to leave. And I think that if they're, this is totally extrapolation, I don't know if this is true, but in the low, lowest level school, if there was anybody who was very culturally aware and they saw what was going on around them, they would probably want to be somewhere where they could engage in these practices um, to a higher degree than they might have been able to. Yeah. Yeah. A more five mm -hmm. question. Do you, is this something that needs to be, like if you were thinking about an intervention with teachers, and be more um, aware and is this something that should be Of so, so we have teachers out there now, right? And so my colleague back there who <coughs> didn't want to sit next to me because he'd be so distracted. Um, so we're working with the district in, in training teachers to get this, because they're there now, right? And to not focus on the fact that some things need to change is not a good solution. That's not ideal though, right? What, what you really want is when they are going through their training, incorporating this not as a standalone class, 
right? But infusing it throughout the, so it's, it's something that just becomes common sense, a socially just curriculum for teacher educators, or, or for pre-service teachers. So I, I think both of them are very, very important. And I know that here there's a lot of talk um, about in, kind of infusing that and blending the two that are currently there because what was LRC and TTE, they became TLS but they still have these two strands, like regular teaching, and then what was language reading and culture teaching, but they should all be talking to each other because if we look at our schools, a lot of our teachers don't look like our students, so they need this knowledge. So I, and it's also school leaders that need this knowledge, right? Because if they're evaluating teachers and providing that mentoring and support, they need to know what to look for to, to guide teachers to do it. So yes, I think all those things are critical. Yeah. I'm curious, um, you spoke about your involvement, I think, in terms of the HOF State Accountability yes. um, Plan. Can you maybe share a little bit about what that experience was like for you, given what you just kind of shared with us this afternoon, in terms of the lens by which you were perhaps maybe um, looking to either um, influence, uh, yeah. provide some influence to the thought process that led into that? And I'm being recorded. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. So I was told, it was an art, like a call for proposals, and the Network for Public Education has very explicit things that they target, like high stakes testing. They, they are not believers in high stakes testing. Professionalization, deprofessionalization of teaching, right? So they are against these models where you get like a six week boot camp and you're put into to a high need area, very much against that. Um, they uh, want states to adopt out, opt out so that parents can say, I don't want my child to, to be doing this, right? They are also very much against um, the violations of privacy where student information is housed in this big thing and they are tracked forever for any disciplinary action. So there are certain things that are part of their vision and ideology. I infused some of the things that I consider to be very important, but it did not make its way into the report card because it's just not part um, of what they see as very important. So I had, for example, a student who was looking at early childhood metrics, and that didn't make it in. Um, our emergent bilingual or ELL students, that didn't make it in. What did make it in, though, was the hypersegregation. Our schools getting better at desegregating schools, but they used metrics that Gary Orfield out of UCLA Civil Rights Project had compiled. So there was that, that piece of it. Um, they're also very much against charter schools and open enrollment and choice because of its role in creating more white flight and, and schools being defunded and hyper segregated again. So that was, and so using that, I used national data sets to be able to compile it and then along a continuum come up with the grades. No one made an A, no one made a B. Like every state had either a C, D, or F. And it's just a function of where we are, like in terms of funding and many other things. Some states are doing things better, right? Vermont is doing things really, really well. California in many ways is doing things really well. Um, Arizona by and large is not doing things well, yeah. So, yes. so, so in the study you did, you had surveys for the teachers, right? Yeah. And then you had focus groups or interviews with interviews. them? Interviews. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell us a little bit more about the measurement, like the kind of survey measures oh, yeah. that you had sure. and um, how you pulled out some of those themes from the teachers? Okay, so for, and I, I had both teachers and students interviewed and filling out measures. So the teachers filled out um, one on beliefs and the one on beliefs was I, I took a lot of items that were from a Pohan and Aguilar 2001 published study that looked at diversity as a whole that had tons of items. And so for you quantitative folks, um, that had very high internal consistency because there were so many items, even though some of those items didn't necessarily go very well together. So I took those and then validated it for use with the different strands that I had. And so that captured the critical awareness, their beliefs about language, um, and then their cultural knowledge and the curriculum, right? So those, those different pieces. Then there was another study um, that the United States Department of Education did. It was called the National Indian Education Study. And so NIES used NAEP, National Assessment of Educational Progress data, 
but they, they got a bunch of scholars of indigenous education together as experts to inform culturally responsive schooling. So the kind of things that they would want teachers to be doing if they were culturally responsive. And those felt like language, curriculum, and cultural knowledge, right? So I did a validation on that measure and included it in the study after piloting it, but changed it to Latino students. So I had beliefs, I had behaviors, and then the interviews um, started out pretty open, like they were guiding questions, but I found that teachers, um, were either very passionate about the cultural piece or were completely unaware of the cultural piece, right? And so you could kind of see that when they were like, well, if they were mot like the same answers, motivation, parent involvement, right? But if they had this knowledge, it was about culture and language and including it. Um, so that was the teachers. For students, I had a measure by Herbert Marsh um, that is the self-competence. And he has beliefs about mathematics, about reading, and then school. And it's been validated with young kids, and I thought, perfect, because I've got young children, right? Eight, eight up to 10, 11 years old. Um, and I used that twice, at the beginning of the year and twice, I mean, at the end of the year. Now, because it was a school district, and I had three different measures for the students, um, the district IRB is very, very adamant that not a lot of instructional time be taken away. Mm -hmm. So I had to validate that measure and truncate it. And luckily, a lot of the items are very repetitive. So I was able to remove some of the items. And I still had pretty robust um, internal consistency. And OK, so that was for self-competence. For ethnic identity, I used Finney's measure, because it tends to be this gold standard, um, even though there's several measures out there. But I, even though I used exploration, students could not answer exploration. So exploration is like when you're thinking about your background and are you, they're not making those kind of choices. So it was more about their pride in, in their back, background. Um, and I did that twice. And then the other, right, the other ethnic identity piece in, in the meme. And then perceived discrimination, I used a subset of the safe C. Mm -hmm. So the safe C um, was validated a little long time ago and it has three sites like general stress for kids perceived discrimination and acculturative stress so um, immigrant communities and their navigation of a, of a new context but I just used the perceived discrimination subset of that and I gave it to them twice so that's what I used and then interviews the interviews with students were focus groups to eliminate disruption um, and those were a lot of fun but so mapping on like you start with this idea of confianza mm -hmm. which I like the way you break it down right have, do you feel like some of those concepts are reflected in these ideas about critical awareness and cultural knowledge? Or do you think that is that something bit? still that needs to be integrated with well, the measurement? And, and what would that, would that look different for thinking about asset-based cultural pedagogy? Or would it just be, you know, trust and hope and confidence would be more generic? Like we look at things like Self academic self advocacy, mm -hmm. right? For example, she's been looking at that, and that might be considered like a proxy for okay. confidence, right? Yes. But is there something that would be unique about an asset based cultural pedagogy efficacy that emerges? Oh, well, that's really Does interesting. That make so, sense? so looking at the little boy, right? Um, and and so he had efficacy, right? He and, and that is the goal of asset based pedagogy. Getting to your question, he's aware of his surroundings. He is aware of society. And we know through psychological research that minoritized communities that are aware that there is prejudice, that's, that's a good thing to learn because it's protective. Because then it isn't about me being deficient. It's about the outside world being deficient. And so even in his answer, right? I'm Mexican and I know people do not want to hear me speaking Spanish, but I am proud of you speaking Spanish. He's aware of that. And in the asset-based pedagogy, it is about student agency. It's about empowering students to be aware, right? Mm -hmm. And be able to act on that in a way that is self-fulfilling, self-determination, right? So in terms of confianza, that does translate to self-competence, self-efficacy, mm -hmm. kind of in a generic sense. The trust, though, when teachers have this critical awareness, I mean, it's work. Um, you have to be invested in the success of students and truly love, I mean to use that word love that we don't tend to hear in, in research, you have to love the human beings you have in front of you and care about them. So I don't think there can be this bond 
um, between teachers and students if there isn't that level of caring. Uh, Angela Valenzuela is the one that's written a lot about that, about caring for students and that students feel that and how teachers might show that in different ways. Um, so I think it's implicit without it being asked, hey, do you love your students? You know? mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. Yeah, we're, we've been looking at Duncan Andrade's ideas about critical hope okay. and thinking about that and, 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 and starting to do some of these interviews and focus groups with youth to kind of get at that idea yeah. and see, you know, that it's not just like the hokey hope where, or false hope where you think like, oh, everything's going to be fine no matter what disadvantages there are in society, but a critical awareness of systemic oppression and being hopeful within that knowledge, right? So, which includes agency, right? Which, like, which I could see that that could emerge more if you have a teacher who's critically aware and who's teaching and it's infused in the curriculum that you could become more hopeful but within a, a very realistic set of understanding of the world. Yeah. Right? So, And I did classroom observations. Um, and so one of the things I saw with teachers that did this, they we're breaking down the stratific like factors that create stratification, embedding it into like social studies or even their reading or math, so that students were aware we don't see these disparities just because oh well that that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. It's purposeful, right? There's ways to eliminate it, but is there the will, right, institutionally to do it? That that's at its core. Um, so it's infusing that into the curriculum developmentally appropriate, right? There's there's a way to do it, but by not talking about it, it just creates more issues than not in, engaging in it. I have another practical question. Sure. So like in Tucson, if you, you put the Mexican American study in place, you, you hit a lot of kids, and like you can yeah. affirm a lot of identity. How does it work, or how do people think it works in places where you've got like refugees from all sorts of places in your classroom? <laughs> like, you can't give every kid a teacher that looks like them, or that speaks their language. Which is the, the reality, right, in many, totally. many cases. And I think that's, that's part of it, because there's even, even in classrooms where it seems like there isn't variability, there's variability, right? You might have LGBTQ students, you might have students who are black Latino. You, I, there's so many different ways, so there's not just like this one package, this is what you give, and this is why it's about learning about students individually, right, and incorporating that in, into instruction. So for refugee students, there's a way to do it. Um, you'd have to find ways to incorporate that, but there's ways to validate, no matter where you are, there's ways to validate, and it's not going to look the same. Even in my own classrooms, they didn't always look the same, but there's a way to infuse what students cared about without it being this kind of like monolithic, well, they're all Latino, so if I just speak Spanish and I hang up piñata, then I'm going to be all right, right? So that's the essentialization of culture. Yeah. To move away from that, it really is getting to know what students believe and appreciate in their home lives, which also have variability. So, yeah, I, I think it would apply because it just looks different depending on where you oh, are. Oh, yeah, no, I'm sure it applies. I'm yeah. not sure if anybody could, like, crack the nut or, like, works towards how you actually So there is work by Refti Kumar. Um, out of the University of Toledo, and she looks at a specific, in her area, refugee students that come from two different backgrounds and how she applied culturally responsive schooling. It, it's fascinating, and it should, if it hasn't come out already in 2018, it should be coming out in the next issue of American Education Research Journal. Um, she, it's a beautiful study where she looks at how and what these teachers were doing. There was another hand. It, it, I was just going to say, it sounds like um, you're saying that there are some sort of universal dispositions that are going to apply regardless of mm -hmm. what culture you might be working with. So, you know, humility and curiosity are going to go a long way long regardless way. of what you're working with. Yes, openness, right? It's like, do you want to learn more or do you think you have all the answers? And one of my earlier studies that interviewed teachers, it wasn't here, it was in Wisconsin, the big divide was the teachers who had all the answers versus the ones that felt, I don't know enough. I need to know more. And it was that openness and willingness that made them better teachers, even though they felt less um, efficacious as the ones that thought they had all the answers, right? But different effects, so. Any questions? No? Do you bring Thanks. your work oh. to schools 
from a professional development standpoint, so I know you go into school as a researcher, but are you also interested in addressing educators in school? Yeah. With your research? So we're doing that. Um, my partner back there. <laughs> we're doing that with TUSD. And it, so last year it was using some of the findings here to build a professional development that went into modules that was kind of a train the trainer. So there were teachers who were already, they, they were known to have these dispositions, already had a lot of that cultural awareness um, and culturally responsive practices. So they were brought in as experts. They received the professional development and now they are going out to the 89 schools and training all the teachers in, in the different schools. Um, and this year, we are training the school leaders to, to do that. So the answer is yes. But I mean, I, and, and that gets back to the earlier question. It's, it's just so much, it's great that we're doing that, but more needs to be done on this end, right? So that the teachers that are coming out are ready to go um, or come from the community. Like there's a huge need for the teachers that are from the community to go back to the community because it's that much, Easier is the wrong word, but there's already that vested interest, right? So, yes. Thank you. Oh, she had oh, one more question. Really good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to get back to something that you just said about this variation between educators that have this critical awareness and think they know it all, and yeah. maybe those who don't, um, who feel that they don't know it all. Yeah. At all. So, how do you account for that measuring that critical awareness? Because I would assume that it would be more dangerous as a student to be in a classroom where my teacher has gone through this critical awareness okay. process uh -huh. and then doesn't really do any more reflection because they've reached a peak, right? I, I'm perfectly aware, like I'm there. I don't need to reflect and uh -huh. do much more than that. And I think that's, I don't know, I wonder if that would be even more dangerous in, in the environment as a student. It's kind of like when somebody knows a little bit of stats and they become statistically dangerous, <laughs> like critically aware dangerous. Um, there's always danger in thinking, I'm done, right? And I, I have nowhere else to go. But the work that we're doing in the school districts, like teachers are reflecting. Um, and once you reach this, like, there, there becomes, there comes a time that's kind of this aha moment that, oh my gosh, this is a lifelong journey, right? And I'm always, going to be thinking about these things. And I've always got something else to learn. Um, but you're right, although some knowledge is better than no knowledge just because of the harm. I don't know, maybe that's a good study. I don't know, <laughs> that might be a really good study. Yes, okay, one. So, um, how, in the work that you're doing, especially the professional development, is there crossover with special education, particularly also for what you're seeing um, now in school, but then I think more so especially in elementary schools where there's more inclusive settings and move away from your self contained classrooms. Right. And so one of the things that you can work with those students anyway, because they haven't had the training. Right. But that intersecting piece of it, because we know that also that students of color are funneled towards self contained right. classrooms, especially if they were age early on. That's right. Um, it comes up because you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you see that students are, are pushed in, into special education as a catch-all and they're overrepresented. So right now the level of work that we're doing is at the school leader level where they're going, at the next session that they have, they're going to have to um, look at their data and see the representation of students in special education, in AP, in gifted and talented, in um, referrals, in expulsions, to see do you have a representation problem? And the answer is probably in most of these schools gonna be yes. It's, it's a huge issue, right? But part of becoming critically aware with the coursework that I, that at least that I'm aware of, is interrogating those issues. So teachers understand that that leads to stratification, that it's the removal of certain students. It's, I mean, all of those deficiency views, right? Um, but it's not taken a center stage in my work just yet, but that's a really good question. I mean, in terms of students who, those who do have needs and are their needs being met. I might recruit you, Desiree, to help with that. <laughs> okay. So for some of the questions about that, I'm sort of the teaching experience. 
environment that the school environment, right? There's a culture within the school. We have some of these teachers that have been teaching for the past year. Yes. When you're going in with this professional development, I mean, we're hoping that this actually comes with the newer teachers coming in and get some change. But when you have, you know, longer teaching, you know, experience in there, how, how do you see this is in some of the professional development that buy in from the teachers to actually start to open up and be receptive to some of this new Great question. There is a lot of resistance um, because it's scary, right? And the approach we've taken is not to be attacking or um, disrespectful, but kind of this is a journey for all of this, uh, all of us. And we've also tried to front load it with research. Like here is the evidence, right? Um, and there's been quite a transformation. It's it's pretty awesome to see what what the teachers have learned from this. I mean, but there are certain sites where there's more pushback. And in those sites, you kind of see that stem from the school leader, right? Because they're not the one. So yes, I mean, it's, it's definitely part of the work and definitely part of the journey. And we've tried to look at that. And there's very skilled um, teachers who do the professional development who were former MAS teachers. So they have so much knowledge. I mean, it's like they know the community, they know all of this, and they've been hit with more resistance than most of us, right, in terms of what we've had to confront. So they're ready for it, and they knew it going in. This is what we're going to see. So we need to prepare ourselves for that. So their expertise is definitely throughout what we're doing. Thank you for that, Angela. So there's no more questions. Thank you once again, Dr. Lopez. Very quick announcements. Our February 16th Terminal speaker has been canceled. Uh, we'll revisit that next year. There will be a faculty data blitz for FSHD faculty. Uh, we encourage grad students and undergraduate students and family studies to come see what faculty are working on. Um, that will be Monday, February 26th. Where's Felice? Is that right? At 4 p.m. in this room. And. Uh, you can always watch this lovely talk again <laughs> on the FMI website. It will be archived. Give us about seven days to get um, put on there, but it will be available. Thank you.